The most appropriate philosophy for a refined human species is compassion and ahimsa or nonviolence. Protecting the weak is our duty as well as our responsibility. They display the signs of human refinement. Hello everyone. How lovely of you to join us on the World Consciousness Alliance today. On behalf of our family of the WCA, welcome. My name is Ami Hughes. This is Renaissance for Humanity, Conversations for Change. This is where we talk to the game changers who simply make life better by their sheer presence and by the actions that promote life, serving life selflessly. We talk today to one such person whose actions speak so expansively about the nobility of his soul. At the height of a very lucrative career in the corporate world as a venture capitalist, he walked away, he made a life-changing decision. And today he is widely known as a venture capitalist for good causes. So all the way from Australia, Melbourne in Australia, we welcome Philip Wallen. Hello there, how are you? Fine, thank you, Hamil. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, I, I believe that uh, Australia, where you are now, from Melbourne, you're really going through some very difficult challenges, especially where the COVID lockdown is concerned. Uh, what's it like there now? It's quite an unusual challenge for us. Uh, we have a, a curfew, so from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m., uh, we have a curfew. We can go out to the park for some exercise for an hour each day. And we can go to the supermarket, the doctors and the chemists, but that's about it. Um, and this is only in the state of Victoria, which has been hardest hit across Australia. Our borders have been closed in Victoria, so we can't even leave the state unless it's for um, a funeral or a relative who is uh, in palliative care and in the last stages of life. So it's been a, a pretty uh, trying time for a lot of people who need to travel into state. So now with all your good causes, all these amazing projects that you're uh, involved in, uh, how, how do you execute them with this type of lockdown? It's, um, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, but nowadays with technology, with Zoom and emails and telephones and Skype and WhatsApp, it's, uh, it's a lot easier than it would have otherwise have been. Uh, as you know, we've got about 500 projects in about 40 countries, so it was almost impossible to travel to all of them. So traveling um, hasn't really been that badly affected. Um, I recently came back at uh, uh, in the first week of February after being on the Sea Shepherd ship in the Western uh, part, Atlantic of West Africa. And I managed to get home just in time. If I was a week later, mm. I would have been locked out on a ship uh, in claustrophobic conditions out at sea, um, unable to, to come home. So to, to that extent, I was, I was very fortunate. Uh, but the Sea Shepherd ships are, uh, many of them are still out there. How, how many are there? Uh, how many in the fleet? Uh, Twelve ships. How did you come to get involved in the Sea Shepherd? Well, I've always been involved in this, um, in this space. I used to be a merchant banker. Uh, yes. you'd, call, you'd call them investment bankers, uh, specializing in corporate finance. And uh, on my 40th birthday, I'd seen uh, so much cruelty, suffering, corruption, uh, throughout all my travels, I decided to to give it all away. I was the vice president of Citibank, and um, I decided to take all the money I'd ever made and give it away with warm hands and die broke. And so far, we're right on budget. So uh, by this stage, we had probably about 200 projects under our belt. And then Sea Shepherd came to came to town from uh, from the United States. They had one ship, small 650-ton ship called the Fowley Moat, and they arrived in Melbourne and they had barely enough fuel to get into the dock. They were running on fumes. Uh, they were impoverished and uh, they had 30 crew members and they were dumpster diving for food. That's how impoverished they were. And they were heading off to Antarctica to confront the Japanese poaching whaling fleet. They've been, for many years, have been ramming the Japanese uh, ships, crashing yes. into them to get them out of Antarctica. Well, I met them that night and I went to a little presentation that they did and only 20 people turned up and, and half of them were crew. Well, I saw what they were doing and I, I just got up and said, look, I really like what you're doing. Tonight I'll give you, this is 15 years ago, 
I'll give you a present of fifty thousand dollars. I'll give you free accommodation in our offices. We have, we have a huge building called Kindness House, and my wife and I will run Sea Shepherd in Australia for you for a couple of years until you could find somebody to do it properly, and that's what we did. Since then, yes, of course, we've only had one ship, and now we've grown. And we're in every ocean on every campaign you could possibly imagine. And uh, the Japanese are out of Antarctica. And in the last three years, we've arrested uh, 54 ships from China and from the European Union, extracting tens of millions of euros in fines and protecting the most vulnerable artisanal fishers, largely in, in Africa, uh, who have been um, made destitute by these criminal poaching organizations from the European Union and China. Now, your interventions uh, with Sea Shepherd on the high seas, is it making a dent in you know, where, where this, this type of poaching, poaching is concerned? Oh, that absolutely. Uh, for example, um, uh, when, you, when you take 54 massive um, crawling vessels uh, out of the ocean, where they're taking hundreds of millions of dollars of, of fish every year, it makes a big dent. We've, we've cleaned out Antarctica. There's, there, there's no toothfish uh, poaching there at the moment. They'll come back, of course, because, because of COVID. We're not there. But uh, we'll go back when we find out that they've gone back. So it's making a great deal of difference, particularly to the artisanal fishers who are very poor in, um, in West Africa, for example. And that's why we're able to take uh, the, the armed naval officers on board our ships and use our ships as a floating platform as we confront these uh, these criminal organizations. And I'm sorry to be so blunt, but they are criminal organizations. The, yes. What was it about their actions that, that really um, affected you so deeply that you got so intensely involved in uh, helping eradicate the coaching on the high seas? Because I think it was... It was largely because of the type of organization Sea Shepherd is. It's an organization that really protects marine animals. And, you know, people go around to all our projects on land and they see the people who work there, they touch the buildings, and it's very palpable. But out in the ocean, out of sight is out of mind. You, go, you don't see anything. But the, the egregious cruelty and, and destruction that is out there is invisible. And all the Sea Shepherd ships have um, some very simple philosophies. All the ships are vegan. No animals or products are consumed by anybody on the ship. It's non-violent. In the 15 years that I've been involved, in fact, 30 years that Sea Shepherd's been involved, no one's ever been killed, no one's been injured. And we've sunk half the Norwegian whaling fleet, half the Icelandic whaling fleet. We've rammed probably 30 or 40 different ships on many continents and uh, never hurt anybody. Now that's a record no other industry could claim. Yes, and you, you're talking about vegan, you're, you're a vegan yourself, right? First having turned to vegetarianism and then to, and then becoming a vegan. Um, yes. Speak to us about that. Well, many years ago, I was, a, um, as I say, a merchant banker. And in the course of my profession, I went out to see a client who had a, was a conglomerate, had interests in many different industries. And one of the industries in which they were active turned out to be a slaughterhouse. And one must remember that in those days, um, I was a meat eater. My favorite food was filet mignon and lobster, a fact for which I'm so profoundly ashamed today. But what I saw that day in that slaughterhouse absolutely terrified me. It shook me up and I was a big, tough, sports loving, macho kind of guy, but it affected me profoundly. And I became a vegetarian on the spot, but I didn't know enough to, to talk or think intelligently about the dairy industry until I went to India on a business trip. And I was walking down the street one day and I saw a dairyman dragging his injured cow to the slaughterhouse. Now the cow had been hit by a lorry and broken her spine and she could hardly walk, she was in agony. To get her to walk, he was throwing chili powder into her eyes and shoving sharp objects up her anus. And alongside her walked her starving, scrawny, bedraggled calf. And he dragged her to the slaughterhouse gates. But before he handed her over to the butcher, the bastard milked her. 
So at the last moment of her life, she was still being abused by a human being. Now, if that doesn't change the heart of a man, nothing will. So when I came back to Australia, I studied the dairy industry and I discovered that it was the most cruel, disgusting, vile gulag of despair. Meat is milk in liquid form. And it's then that I decided that I would never consume dairy products ever again. So my shoes, my belt, even my watch band have no animal products in them at all. And uh, my health is, is great. My, I, I can look in the mirror uh, every morning in the days when I was able to have a shave and uh, I could look at myself with a clear conscience. So that was, that's my brief uh, metamorphosis into the vegan world. But, but you, you asked a very interesting question. I'm sorry, Amy. You asked an interesting question about uh, what was it about Sea Shepherd itself. And Sea Shepherd has many fine qualities, but so have many others. And most of them, I have to tell you, are in India. Uh, the passion, the, uh, the caring for other living beings come from organizations at grassroots level that I met and have loved in India for 20 years. I often say, I, I scribble down some, some thoughts, thinking about what I'd say to you today. I didn't want to bore you, but, but I, often, I, I, often, I often say it uh, when, I, when I give these talks, um, you know, King Lear, late at night on the cliffs, asks the blind Earl of Gloucester, how do you see the world? And the blind man Gloucester replies, I see it feelingly. And shouldn't we all? Yes. Now, the, Ang the Anglo-Indian uh, poet and writer, uh, Rudyard Kipling wrote uh, in World War I about soldiers dying in the war. And he wrote, uh, and if they ask you why we died, tell them that our fathers lied. Everything we think we know about the meat and dairy industry is a preposterous lie. You see, today the world is crying out for only two things, leadership and the truth. So today we simply tell the truth, fearlessly and forcefully. The wise Chinese actually have a term for it, Zheng Jiao. Listen to the friend who tells you the truth, even when it hurts. So let's just tell the truth, fearlessly and forcefully. That is what the Sanskrit word Satyagraha means, the truth force. Now, uh, Brendan Kennelly in the book of Judas wrote, if you want to serve your age, betray it. But what does that mean to betray your age? It means expose its lies, humiliate its conceits, debunk its arrogance, and condemn them to face harsher truths. Alvin Toffler said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Now, I have long admired Count Moltke, the great Prussian general, a soldier who preferred to think rather than to speak, a man silent in seven languages. So, you see, it takes courage to stand up and speak, but it also takes courage to sit down and listen. So, as I say, there was a time when my favorite food was filly and lobster, and to this day I'm still profoundly ashamed of it. So what made me you know, decide to leave that world of lobsters and Learjets in exchange for shelters and slaughterhouses? What made me decide to give it all away? What made me decide to, uh, to take nothing but pictures, own nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time? Mm. You see, something well, happened to me. Go ahead. Yes. Could, could we call that like a, an inner awakening? Yes, yes, of course. So when you, when you turned your, your back um, on, a very, on this lucrative career that you built for yourself, I mean, you were uh, also uh, honored, you were like named uh, the, among the top 40 brightest and best executives in Australia. Now, what does, do these sort of titles mean to you today? What did it mean to you? Did it mean anything to you back then? 
And moving forward now, how do you look on these accolades, these titles, these honors, these awards? I mean, uh, not only that, uh, you've also received the Order of Australia uh, medal in the Queen's uh, Birthday Honors List, Australian of the Year in Victoria. What do these mean to you? Well, at the time, I thought they were nice things to have. I, I think the people who were most pleased and most um, impressed by it were basically my mum and maybe my grandmother. Uh, but um, I, I can't remember how I felt. But right now, I must tell you, I never even think about them. In the overall scheme of things, they actually don't, they don't register. They just don't register. Uh, however, like uh, also, they, they give you uh, that kind of re recognition in the world. Uh, maybe it gives you a, a better, a bigger platform for you to convey your messages of compassion, of kindness, of uh, uplifting humanity with all these various projects, more than 500 uh, projects that you're involved in, uh, in where humanitarian work is concerned. So uh, they may have helped you um, to deliver, for people to sit up and listen to a figure who is so well known and respected. Yes, I suppose to that extent it might have helped me uh, in the early stages of opening doors. Um, the irony of it all is that I became better known only after I was involved in a certain debate about 10 yes, years ago. Yes, meet off the table. Yes, that's right. And uh, mm -hmm. I was, uh, at the time, um, I'm, I'm not a flamboyant person. I, I, I'm not a person who likes to be in the public eye. In fact, uh, Rupert Murdoch's press uh, described me as being reclusive. reclusive. Probably the only honest statement ever published in any of his papers ever in the history of the organization. But I think I, I, I was reclusive. But once this, uh, this nine minute talk and my debate uh, occurred, it was, I think it, was, it reached over 60 million people and had over 30 million people view it and independently transferred, uh, translated into about 20 something languages. My cover was blown. You know, I had to be dragged out of the closet, so to speak. And uh, I'm, I still don't feel that it, I'm, I'm a natural person for the public eye, but um, I, I, I don't back off either. If, if the opportunity requires me to speak, um, I'm prepared, prepared to do that. That debate uh, really made a huge impact, as you say, uh, more, you know, more than a million people. How many people watched it? Uh, what 60, kind of reaction? 60 million. 60 million. Oh, that's, yeah. that's, that's a really huge number. What kind of reaction did you get from them? Um, did they come up to you? Did they uh, say that they were going to be turned vegetarian or even vegan for that matter? Because yeah. really, when we think about the dairy industry, we'll get back to, the, to that. And uh, what can we do? to awaken those that are running the dairy industry? What can be done? Have you had in, uh, any conversations with, uh, with such people? Uh, I mean, the, the feedback has been massive. Uh, I, 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 hate talk, I hate talking about myself, but uh, if I could just describe in simple terms the number of people who've, who've gone vegan, I'm not talking about just a few thousand, I'm talking hundreds of thousands who've just changed overnight. Even in India, I gave a talk in the Rajiv Gandhi Center to 2000 wealthy Indian entrepreneurs, including Amartya Sen who was in the audience. And um, you have no idea how many people came up to me afterwards or even during Q and A and said, look, we're gonna change our factory canteens uh, from uh, uh, non-veg to veg. Um, now that is a massive number of lives saved when you consider that the average human being in the West consumes four and a half thousand animals in their lifetime. So if you could have fa factory, can and you know how big factories are in India, particularly for some of these big organizations, they are truly massive. If you could get people in the factory canteens only eating vegetarian food during the day, you're saving millions of lives in a year. So, so that's India, but um, other countries as well. We have massive success in Israel, for example. And the number of vegans there is, is grow, going through the roof, even in Australia. 20 years ago, the word vegan was a word that people couldn't even pronounce. And today, it's on 
in public debate and, and part of our, our narrative and our discourse and our arguments as well. Uh, but now people are now personalizing the debate um, uh, about they ask me very personal questions which seem to resonate with them. Uh, you know, what exactly made you decide that this had to be your cause? Because I could have picked anything else. Mm. And I, I, I just have to tell them, you know, I, I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the many cancers that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before in the slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother whale as a harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. And I discovered that when we suffer, we suffer as equals. And in their capacity to suffer, a dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. So it's not about me. Uh, I'm always reminded of the Greek poet Horace. Change only the name, and my story is also about you. Yes, it, because everything is interlinked, right? And people are um, maybe slowly, hopefully, but surely waking up to the idea that as goes one, so goes all, yes. irrespective yes. of species. Yes. You know, uh, we should like be getting away from speciesism today and, and sure. think of, of uh, life as life, all life, all life matter. It, it, well, you, I, it, it, I find it to be such a, an astonishing abdication of human responsibility. Um, at, at law school, we're talk, taught about this thing of the duty of care. When somebody comes into your building, you have a duty of care to make sure they don't get injured. If someone comes to visit you in your home, you have a duty of care to make sure they don't fall down the stairs or that you don't spill boiling water from a teapot on their, into their lap. You have a duty of care. But nowhere in the world do you ever hear of a duty to care. Nowhere in the world except one place. In the Indian Constitution, six, Section 52. It shall be the fundamental duty of every Indian citizen to show compassion to all living beings in the country in the Indian constitution. Now that is something that's more observed uh, uh, in the mind rather than in practice. But we have, people just don't understand the sheer magnitude. Let me describe it thus. In human history, only 100 billion human beings have ever lived. Seven and a half billion people are alive today. And we human beings torture and kill two billion two billion sentient, living, loving animals every week. We stab and suffocate one billion ocean animals every eight hours. If we were killed at the same rate, we would be wiped out in one weekend. One weekend. So trillions of fish are ground up into pellets to feed the livestock. Vegetarian cows are now the world's largest ocean predators. It's an astonishing fact. Now, the oceans, as you know, are dying in our time. By 2048, all our fisheries will be dead. And they are the lungs and the arteries of the earth. Oceans sequester more CO2 than all the forests of the world put together. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one. And we now face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism had done this, a biologist would call it a virus. It is a crime of unimaginable proportions. So I what just want people to get their heads to, around oh, it. Yes, yes, it is. Um, what is, is it because uh, people, um, yeah. why is it there's so much apathy um, within the human species at large? I mean, 60 million people as you say, you know, uh, have already sort of awakened to the horrors of the cruelty uh, to other species on our planet. Uh, as a, you know, not only that, I mean, we are also perpetrating uh, atrocities uh, on humans as well. So what would it take to actually awaken that compassion within, within the human species to make them understand that you know, we are interlinked, that, you know, what, you know, what we do have, what we do, every single action of ours 
has consequences. Where does it begin? Where, where does educating humanity about compassion and kindness and caring actually begin? Is it with the governments? Is it with schools? Is it with parents? You know, I, I often say that, you know, I, I, I give talks in many, many countries, sometimes to small audiences, you know, two or 300 people, sometimes to audience of 5,000 people. And they're all good, caring, decent, loving people who all genuinely want to change the world, as long as they don't have to change themselves. But life doesn't work that way. First, we change in our hearts, and then the world follows. So when people say, where does it start? Does it start with government or schools or kids or parents? No, it starts with us. We make the decision that enough is enough. And it's not just against the animal kingdom. You know, there are two peak predators on this planet, um, orcas in the ocean and human beings on land. In the 20th century, human beings killed 200 million members of their own species. Orcas killed none. And we shouldn't expect anything from our governments either. In the 20th century, 100 million people have been killed by their own government. You know, Victor Hugo said that there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Yes, come. But I say there is nothing more destructive than a bad idea whose time has passed. The time for meat and dairy has passed. So you have a very close relations and ties and associations with India. Were you born there? I was. I was born in Bangalore. So how long did you live in India before you're now an Australian citizen, before you made the move? I, I came to Australia when I was 17. What made you go to Australia from India? It, it seemed to be the, the thing that our community did in those days. You know, at some, my, my, I came on my own. My family had been in India for probably 300 years. My great great grandfather was uh, one of my so ancestors, if you like, was uh, holds the world record of being the world's longest serving Anglican priest in England. And he did his PhD in those days, which was quite a rare thing, at Oxford. And his son also did his PhD at Oxford at a different college. Um, and he became a priest, and his son came to India as a judge in the Hooghly High, Hooghly High Court, which was the center of the British Empire at the time. And I think uh, that old guy decided that uh, he was having sampled the delights of, of India, he was never going to leave and they never did. So our family stayed there for two or 300 years. My, my beloved uncle uh, was a very well-known Indian Air Force officer, it was Air Marshal Malcolm Walland and um, highly decorated in war and in peace. And um, he was also the chairman of HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics. So mm -hmm. we had four, four generations of our family went to the same school in Bangalore. So our, our, our ties and roots have, are, are both rich and, and deep. I'm, I'm looking through this list of, you have uh, you know, a, a list of awards as long as my, uh, my arm, you know. Uh, Australian Humanitarian Award, um, Supreme Master Shining, World Hero Award. Tell us about this, the Supreme Master Shining World Hero Award from Asia. What's this it's, about? It's a, it's a very interesting organization. They basically are a pro-vegan organization with millions and millions of members. They're into diet and peace and vegan veganism, of course, is very important meditation, all the things that um, resonate with me. I didn't know much about them at all, but whenever I gave a speech, I noticed they had their media people there filming it. And, um, and they own a number of restaurants around the world called Loving Hut. I don't know how many hundreds of them. And I would often go and have dinner there. Didn't realize there was a connection until they turned out to know quite a lot about me. In fact, they knew more about me than my mum did. So. Um, that's that's how that happened. Uh, going down the list uh, with with your awards, humanitarian award, and a key project in Costa Rica as well. Costa Rica is a very very interesting country. No armed forces. They don't believe in violence at all. They've hardly got a police force. Um, India pioneered the idea of animal birth control, and having shelters for animals that you pick up in the streets. 
Costa Rica and a uh, wonderful, better, better resurgent scientist, they say we're going to have a shelter free country and all the surgery and all the care for the animals is done out in the street. And as a result, they try to bring the communities and the community animals closer together to see them as joint sharers of community space. Um, I think it's a very enlightened environment, very enlightened bunch of activists in the country. And I think it's a, it's a reasonably good model because you can never build enough shelters in India to care for the number of animals that are injured or starving or are being born, even if you had the very best animal birth control procedures in place. And India does have, by and large, the best in any way. Okay, uh, let's look at your, uh, you know, at your kindness, your kindness farms, your kindness house. You're big on kindness. So let's speak, let's speak about kindness. How did the idea for, for these, can you, do you call them kindness uh, operational silos? How did they yeah. all begin? Well, silo, kindness is the, is the term off the top. I'll give you an example with kindness house. That turned out, that was an experiment. It was a $15 million building in a beautiful part of Melbourne, 800 meters from Parliament House, um, 40,000 square feet, and um, in a very bustling, exciting part of town. I brought together about 45 different NGOs, very small ones, uh, who had been basically working off the kitchen table. And uh, we had we built serviced offices, which had everything, offices, boardrooms, training rooms, kitchens, showers, movie theater, everything like that. Over 300 young, smart, energetic, ambitious young people who really want to make a difference. And we have people like Sea Shepherd, Greenpeace, the United Nations, the Wilderness Society, social firms, the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence, you name it. We, we have the creme de la creme of all hardworking, thought-provoking thought activists in the building. It, it had some unusual features. I paid all the bills and there was no rent. So all they had to do was feed themselves. So they had high speed communications. It was a fully functional serviced office that a multinational would be happy to have. And um, they came in there and they all worked together, cooperating with each other. It, there were two very important clauses in the contract I had with them. If they ate animals in my building, I would kick them out. And two, if they had a dog, and they didn't bring him to the office, I would kick them out. So it was a very happy environment. Um, and for 25 years, uh, these people would uh, conduct their own business, whether it's for the environment, for the arts, for the, uh, for the mentally challenged, whether it was changing the, the laws for, for animals, taking care of the forests, the oceans, refugees. They all did their own thing, but from time to time, they would come together, to, usually when they had an event, and they'd come together and enjoy each other's company and parties and all that kind of thing. It's a, it's a, it was just, it was a great idea. It's a great idea and it's paid off in bundles. The kindness farms started off with the shelters, for example, uh, with the kindness street programs where the dog catching vans would go out and bring the dogs in, uh, do the spay and neuter anti-rabies injections, bringing rabies down in many places down to zero. And the dogs are released back on the same street corner three days later. And then we discovered, for example, that there were a lot, lot of people, poor people living in the streets who would sleep under a tree or, or under a shop awning. And they'd always have a dog or two as company for security. And they'd beg for food during the day. So we decided to try an experiment, signed a contract with a restaurant, and the restaurant provides a hot meal, which is a large mound of rice, a kind of rasam so uh, soup that's poured over the top of it, a vegetarian curry. It's on a large banana leaf and then wrapped up in newspaper to, uh, to keep it hot, plus whatever fruit is in season, apple, pear, banana or peach, and a bottle of water. And if you go on the internet, you'll see us handing out, including me, handing out the food to the, to the poor people. And they would always share the food with, with, the, with the animals. And we say to them, look, don't treat this like, a, like charity. If you see a dog has given birth to puppies or someone's whipping a horse or a lorry's hit a cow, go to any shop, they let you use the phone, call the shelter, we'll send our ambulance to pick up the animals. And these poor people said, sure. So I think there are about four at the moment. Um, uh, and we, uh, my long-term plan was to have a hundred. 
and I was going to brand them like Starbucks. So when I die, some local Indian guys can just divide them up amongst themselves and it's easy to run. And then we went into Kindness Farms, basically having a number of acres with a biogas plant, usually a couple of thousand animals so from cows and buffaloes and sheep and uh, goats and uh, dogs and cats and camels and even emus of all things. And usually about 50,000 plants are planted on the property, uh, probably between 50 and 60 employees. And uh, Kindness Farm is almost a self-contained um, ecosystem. Um, the cow dung is used in the biogas plant to generate cooking gas. They're almost 100% self-sufficient in cooking gas, 50% self-sufficient in electricity. The slurry that comes out of the pipe is used as fertilizer to grow fruit, nuts, vegetables, and flowers. The urine is used to produce Ayurvedic medicines. I mean, the Indian people there are extremely innovative. And Ayurvedic medicine in India has been going on for probably 5,000 years. So it's, it's worked for them. Uh, allopathic medicine is a completely different discipline. Um, I think it's, it's great. It's, it's, it's an interesting idea. And uh, it's homegrown in India and long may it prosper. And we've, we've gone into kindness skies and kindness oceans with uh, protecting the Oliver Ridley turtles, for example, in, uh, in the Bay of Bengal, which used to be such a beautiful place in the past, but it's now become a sewer. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a work in progress. And uh, the reason I put them into these operational silos is because I wouldn't be able to manage them either. Not that I manage them at all, but I won't be able to have a coherent conversation if I didn't, you know, have them organized in a fairly disciplined sort of way. Why did you come up with the, with the name kindness? Was it something that, uh, how? It's, it's, it's ultimately, it's just a word, but it has power behind it. If I had the opportunity to do it again, I might still use the same word, but I, I often say this, the most beautiful word ever written at any time, in any country, in any language, came from India, from the Upanishads 3,000 years ago, Ahimsa, non-violence to any living being. Now, let me tell you this. It is beautiful, not because it describes our nationality, our politics, our religion, our diet, or our lifestyle, but because it describes our character. Ahimsa describes your character. It says we reject violence wherever and whenever it arises, in our streets, in our homes, in our thoughts, in our hearts, and at our dining tables. And it's not just about animal rights. It really is about human wrongs. Animal rights, as it happens, is the greatest social justice issue since the abolition of slavery, and you can put that in the bank. It is a revolutionary event more powerful than the Industrial Revolution, the Reformation, the Hubble Telescope, or anything ever conceived by Darwin, Copernicus, Einstein, or Freud because it protects the most precious of all things, life. People often ask me, what are you? You know, what religion are you? And nowadays I just say, I've invented a new term. I say, I am Ahimsan. And I believe people who follow this kind of logic are on the right side of history because we are creating the new enlightenment the second renaissance. That's what we're doing. Mm. Hence, we speak about the renaissance of humanity here on the World Consciousness Alliance platform because the ethos of the World Consciousness Alliance, as you've already picked up uh, you know, from our discussions here, uh, it is about um, these evolutionary attributes of ahimsa, nonviolence, you know, it is not just a word, as you say, we're talking about compassion and kindness. The time has come for this. Where do you see humanity going from here? Like with COVID now, how much responsibility do we take as a human species for what is happening uh, regarding the COVID situation? 
Well, it's, I have a very apocalyptic view of the future. I, I see once respected countries like the United States, who've gone to hell in a handbasket under Donald Trump. Um, I, I see Putin. I see Duterte in the Philippines, where we've got projects. I see countries in South, South America who are going to hell in a handbasket. This new kind of right-wing, uh, inward-looking um, economic and political mantra has turned us inwards. And that is a frightening and terrifying thought. As I said, you know, by 2048, all our fisheries will be dead. And if that number doesn't seem to sink in, it really means that by 2048, unless there is something radically done, the game is over for us. Um, if any of these algorithms are true, and they all are, it means that no child under the age of five is ever going to reach retirement age. It is a mathematical impossibility. It just can't be done. But however, like we look at it in this way, that every, every, um, every negative action, every negative thought, we just simply uh, keep turning the tables, keep putting out more positivity. The, the pushback is more positivity out there and more compassion out there. Are there other people like you who are coming together, you know, people with funds, people with wherewithal, with the skills, with the talents, et cetera, you know, coming to, you know, to uh, give a helping hand to make these causes great, greater? Of course, yes, there are other people who are involved, but I don't think most people understand the sheer gravity of the problem. The, the, the only way people change, ultimately, I often say it as a joke, the only thing that'll make someone change and, and after he's gone past the age of 21 is if he finds a religion or he has a full frontal lobotomy. We have got to, get, to give people the hard, cold facts that this is an existential threat. In the old days, we would say for your grandchildren, and now we're saying for your children. In fact, that's not even true. It's an existential threat to themselves, that the threats are going to happen to us. I know uh, in, uh, in 2013, I gave a talk here in Melbourne to about 2,000 people, and I suggested they ought to watch a movie called Contagion about a bird flu that had come to, to the United States. It had all the most famous actors from Hollywood in it, a remarkable film. And I, I said, you've got to watch this film, but don't treat it as a movie treat it as a documentary that hasn't even happened yet. And after my speech was over, some people came up and attacked me for being alarmist and trying to frighten everybody. Well, they're not saying that anymore now we've got COVID because that's exactly what's happening and happened in, in the movie. M my um, armory, if you like, is to pre present people with the absolute facts, telling them that these are the consequences if you don't act and act promptly. And these are the reasons why I believe it is important. You know, I'm not a Cassandra. I don't think heavens are falling, um, but I'm not a Pollyanna either, saying everything is going to be fine in the morning. Let's all get together and sing Kumbaya. That's not going to happen. That's not going to help. We need to frighten the living daylights out of people to get them to change. And by getting them to change, we get them to change government policy. And that is the mission. With the advent of COVID, hopefully that is going to go um, a long way to, uh, to executing the plan and making it happen. You know, with yeah. more and more people waking up to the harsh realities of what our actions or non-actions have contributed to yes. uh, our societies and the world at large. And the great um, historian Barbara Tuckman said that uh, she defined folly as acting against our own best interests. That's folly. Let me give you some examples of human folly. And people have got to understand it. So we can, if we can't identify the problem, we can't solve it. Forest depletion caused by the livestock industry globally costs three times as much as the recent global financial crisis. Zoonotic diseases like SARS, mad cow disease, avian flu, COVID, etc., from caged animals, now threaten a pandemic 
to rival the Black Death, which wiped out half of Europe. The World Bank says that one influenza pandemic will cost $1 trillion, at least, but more likely between three and $10 trillion. And there are more than 100, uh, CDC says over 100 of them coming down the pike at us. And meat and dairy is now killing us with heart diseases and cancers and osteoporosis and diabetes. Harvard University says that one third of early deaths can be avoided by just not eating meat. Dr. Kasley, while an Indian, wrote in the Lancet saying that India now accounts for 70% of the world's cardiovascular disease due to their addiction to dairy. And Medicare has now bankrupted the United States. They would need $8 trillion invested in treasury bills just to pay the interest, and they got precisely zero. As I would say as a little boy, they've got ladoos. They could shut down every school, university, army, navy, air force, marines, homeland security, FBI, and they still will not have enough money to pay their doctor bills. So how big is $8 trillion? That's how much the whole of Asia will need for the next 10 years for all the projects for electricity, roads, water, telecommunications, high-speed rail from China, um, Malaysia, Thailand, India, Singapore, um, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, plus the new Silk Road from Central Asia through Europe. It's four mm -hmm. times as big as India's GDP and double the total reserves of India and China combined. And Oxford has now said that, you know, my TV debate, get animals off the menu. If everyone had followed the results of us winning that debate, that would save $30 trillion in health and environmental damage alone. And now we discover that antibiotics pumped into livestock every day cause antimicrobial resistance in the animals and in humans. Yes. And that will kill 10 million people per annum by 2050 and will cost the global community $100 trillion a year. So if you thought $8 trillion was a big number, what about $100 trillion? That is 60 times as much as the entire world spends every year on aircraft carriers, missiles, bombs, bullets, drones, destroyers, tanks, planes, mines, guns, and spies. With this, with this COVID pandemic, COVID-19, it's time for that to redefine. And uh, the WCA just brought about a, a, a brilliant song. It's called Reimagine, reimagining everything you know, uh, about, about the human capacity to think, to feel, to share, to give, that, to reimagine, redefine. That time is now. Do you feel, uh, do you feel optimistic about this? It depends on which day of the week you ask me. <laughs> um, there are times when I feel optimistic, but I, a song is a wonderful thing to have. It might be a rallying point for people, but ultimately, um, jingoistic chants in the West in particular nowadays carry much more sway when people pump their chests and say, USA, USA. That resonates more strongly with the great unwashed, with the big, big populations of the world as they become more um, inward looking, shall we say. Mm -hmm. So I'm all in favor. Uh, some of the friends of mine from, from meditation, uh, they believe that everyone meditating together changes the consciousness of a planet. And maybe it does. I'm all in favor. Uh, this is not a type of one size fits all. And I'm not binary. I'm not saying one is one solution is is is, is the only solution. I think we ought to battle this this matter on all fronts. What I do say is that there are so many significant challenges that we need to accept to give us the breathing space so we can rely on this the idea of compassion and care and uh, ethics. To, to sort of infiltrate um, into, into our hearts and souls. Uh, so we give ourselves a chance to redefine, to have this renaissance, because that will take time. If, we, if history has taught us anything uh, in the last 100 years, is that we're a profoundly recalcitrant species. We are slow to learn and we learn only 
when all other avenues have been exhausted. Well, hopefully that time is now. Um, Philip, uh, not only that, your, your philanthropy not only extends to uh, raising life and helping humanity and other species uh, of life, you, you're also involved in uh, the arts, in, in the film, film industry. Uh, to what extent and how? In a very, very peripheral, modest sort of way. Um, art and film are ways in which people communicate with each other. And artists generally tend to see things from a different perspective to the average person in the street. So to some extent, I, I support them where I can. Um, artists, as a general rule, whether it's music or, or painting or, uh, or poetry or literature, have uh, an, an interesting way of looking at life. I can rem I recall that uh, uh, during the war, uh, Picasso was living in Paris and Hitler sent one of his um, officers from the, the Nazi party to Paris to try to um, encourage some sort of um, endorsement from the artist for the Nazi cause. And the Nazi official went into Picasso's apartment in Paris and saw the painting of Guernica. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a horrendous painting of the damage done to the Basque community. It was cr cruelty and mayhem in, the, in this artwork. And the German official said, trying to carry favor with the artist said, that's wonderful. Did you do it? And Picasso replied, no, you did. Mm. That is the type of message that an artist can bring to the table in a very pungent, cogent sort of way with just one sentence or a few brush strokes. So to that extent, I'm, I, I play a very tiny, minuscule role in lubricating the wheels so they can do what they do best. But you do, whether big or small, you do something about it. Uh, from all the activities that you're involved in, it is always about serving unconditionally, giving of yourself. I mean, you've given all your wealth away. Do you have anything left yet? I'll be okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. Talk to us about your kindness awards. Um, uh, who do you uh, target these awards? Um, are we looking at ethics in business, ethics and doing honorable business, etc.? Is it is it within the corporate world? Within you know, uh, what are the areas uh, for these awards that you have um, uh, that you have? established the kindness gold medal award in, in every profession and industry in which i've had any involvement uh, the people that in that in those industries always find a way each year to honor one of their peers whether it's in banking finance law mining aviation aerospace you name it engineering they honor one of their peers who's given a great deal to that particular field everywhere except in this particular space. And I thought, and it, 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 just take the animal, animal protection world, animal rights, animal welfare. It's so highly balkanized. They spend most of their, spend much of their time fighting amongst themselves. And I decided, look, I never want to get involved in the day-to-day -day internet sign wars. I'm going to stay above it all. So every year we'll have a gold medal award um, named the Winston Concerts Gold Medal and a $20,000 prize. And it's been going for 20 odd years, I can't really remember. And we give it to somebody who's devoted their lives to doing, doing good things. And over, the ma over many years, we've given it to remarkable people. Yes, um, I see amongst them you have Dr. Jane Goodall. Uh, who, are, who are the others? Uh, uh, the Pradeep Nath from Vishakhapatnam was, was one of the early ones. Uh, Jane, Jane Goodall was another, Paul Watson from Sea Shepherd, Peter Hammerstead, um, uh, Andrew Lindsay from Oxford, a brilliant theologian and, and author of hundreds of, of books, uh, Colin Campbell from Cornell who wrote the China study on, on veganism, um, a couple of years, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, sorry, uh, Damien Manda from Zimbabwe with the anti-poaching squads. A uh, couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of giving the award on stage to Sir David Attenborough. It's, uh, it reads like a who's who. In fact, nowadays, uh, it started off with a very sort of modest kind of low-key. Malika Gandhi from India was another. 
it was a very um, low key sort of an award. But nowadays, it's considered one of the most sought after prizes in the world. We're having people from the United Nations getting friends of theirs to nominate them for the award. And, and just before we go, there's something I'd like to ask you. Have you eaten off a banana leaf? And how was the experience? Oh, I spent most of my, I, I was an only child, so I spent a lot of my time wandering around the jungles of India uh, with uh, st- living amongst the people in the villages and eating off a banana leaf is, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a joyful memory for me. In fact, I, I do it every year when I return to India. It, uh, at night, sometimes when I'm having trouble going to sleep, I close my eyes and my mind wanders back to those simple days down south when uh, eating off a banana leaf and drinking water from a well and having a thing called a raggy ball uh, for, for lunch uh, uh, was considered a great treat for me. In fact, uh, when you, I stay, with your so fingers, when I stay in the Oprah, or was oh, it? Yes. Of course, no, but, but that's the only way to eat. Uh, but when I come to India, I stay around the country at the Obroy hotels and the chefs know we're coming. And uh, the first meal that they always bring out on a beautiful silver tray is raggy ball. It's a meal consumed by the poorest or the poor people in the villages in the South. And they always, even in the North, they make it, they actually call Bangalore to, to get the recipe and they make it up North. They don't make it as well, but they do make it. Uh, you know, as we uh, wrap up now, what would you like to say? You know, I think we do need a new form of, of from the government's point of view, a new kind of jurisprudence, a new kind of way of laws, a type of foro conscientiae, a court of the conscience. Um, I guess uh, in my journey uh, through Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, I've learned a few lessons. And I've learned that a man is measured not by how much money he makes, but by how much of it he's willing to give away particularly to strangers. And if you wish to increase a man's share of happiness, do not aim to increase his possessions, simply decrease his desires. So Socrates and Epicurus were right. Uh, The unexamined life is not worth living. It's, It's not a life, it's a life sentence. And you don't find your character on Wall Street because it lives on the on the road to Damascus. And my heart resonates to the words of W.H. Auden. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. So uh, I think that's roughly how I feel our lives are going to have to change. Um, men and, and women really need to change the ways in which we see our own role in life. I don't know if you remember Martin Nimmel, the great German priest, philosopher, and U-boat captain. Uh, he spent eight years in prison for just for condemning German intellectuals for being cowards. And he said, uh, when the Nazis came for the communists, I remained silent. I was not a communist. When they locked up the Democrats, I remained silent. I was not a Democrat. When they came for the trade unionists, I did not speak out. I was not a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I remained silent. I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out. Men and women must speak out and act courageously. Is it not better to light a candle than to curse the darkness? All the darkness in the world cannot put out the light of a single candle. So I believe another day is dawning and on a quiet night, I can feel a heartbeat. I know it'll be difficult, but I always remember Gandhiji's words. First they ignore you and they laugh at you. Then they fight you and then you win. Now the last sentence of Scott Fitzgerald's book, The Great Gatsby reads, so we beat on boats against the tide, drawn back ceaselessly into the past. I ask you, are we to live forever in a sick, smug and cruel past? Let's not relive history. Let's make history because that is what leaders do. They make history. Now Judge White's closing words in the bonfire of the vanity were these. The law is humanity's first attempt at decency. 
So I ask you and all your followers and friends to join us in a battle, in a war that decency cannot afford to lose. Because in the end, only three things matter. How deeply you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things that were not meant for you. Eating meat, cruelty, ignorance was not meant for you. That's the message. Philip Wallen, philanthropist extraordinaire. It has been an honor to have this conversation with you on the World Consciousness Alliance. Thank you for all you do on behalf of the animals, on behalf of all the vulnerable who cannot help themselves because of the very circumstances that was induced and thrust upon them. Thank you very much for your caring, for your kindness, for your compassion, for your loving unconditionally. God bless you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.